there we go. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm doing something today I've never done before in my life, which is that this is actually the second keynote for a second organization I'm giving today. Or I guess this is not a keynote so much as a seminar, but it is, um, the first one was this morning in Israel. And that was very much a, um, a sort of a presentation. This is not going to be a presentation of that type. This is going to be more of a, a working group. And in this way, it's, it's, it, we're going to do some stuff together. And that's going to prompt some discussion. And hopefully we emerge some ideas out of this. Um, so you're going to need some paper and a pencil, because I'm actually going to put you to work. So uh, take a second to do that. Get yourself something to write with. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, you should be seeing a PowerPoint slide now. Can someone give me a thumbs up? Yes, thank you, Julie. All right, so um, let's get to work. So the first task is called pick a number. And what I want you to do is write down a number between one and two. So just on your piece of paper, just write down a number on between one and two. Okay. So yeah, it's, this shouldn't this shouldn't take too long to write down that number. Okay, good. Um, all right. Um, what I want you to do now is to write down a different number between one and two. Okay, are we good? Yeah, it seems like I'm getting some nods from people. Feel free to have your cameras on. I know that that was said not to, but it helps with a little bit of interaction with me. Okay, so now I want you to write down a different number between one and two. And I'm really emphasizing the different part here. Okay, so for example, if the first number you wrote was 1.5 and the next number you wrote was 1.6, this time, write a number between one and two that you're not re representing using a decimal. Okay, so I'm asking you to shift not just what the number is, but the type of number it is and the type of representation it is. Does that make sense? Can someone give me an example of a number they've written down so far? Feel free to turn on your mic and just. Learn one seven over 13. Uh, Leslie, say again. 15 over 14. 15 over 14. There's an example of a number that's between one and two. Can someone offer a different number between one and two? One and two, two. fifths. Okay. All right. So now you're going to write a different number between one and two. Pi over two. More different. Petra? Pi over two. Pi over two. Okay, so we see what's going on here now. All right, so what I want you to do is keep writing down numbers between one and two that are different. Really, really different from each other. All right, you don't have to share right now. Just write down as many different numbers between one and two as you can. All right, so let's let's do a little bit of uh, sharing out here. So I heard, I think Leslie, you said fourteen over or fifteen over fourteen was one. I heard one and one eighth. Uh, Petra gave me pi over two. Can someone tell me something else that you wrote down as a number between one and two? Root three. Pardon me. Root three. Root three. Okay, somebody else, please. One plus root two over two, all over two. Okay, thank you. E minus one. What did you say? E minus one. Oh, e okay. minus one, okay. Thank you. I've got, I've got one over sine pi thirds, for example. One over sine of pi, pi, pi over three. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, 1.2 squared. Okay. 150%. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Uh, two sine 60. Two sine 60. Ellen five. Say that again, please. Ln of five, ln of five. Oh, ln, natural log of five. Okay, thank you. That's pretty good. In fact, that's not just pretty good. That is remarkable. Um, that is a really nice collection of different numbers between one and two. Um, if you're interested in what I just did, it, what I just did to you is called a learner-generated example. It comes from Watson and Mason. Uh, I was a little bit overly explicit about what I wanted. If I had more time, we would emerge this more slowly. Okay, so that's task number one. You, you've, uh, you've done completed task number one. We're now going to move on to task number two. Okay, so you did a great job picking different numbers between one and two. Task number two is very different. So task number two, um, is a task about the ski club. So the ski club is gonna go skiing and there's 10 members of the club and they've all raised different amounts of money for the, for the trip. So they've done some fundraising, they've raised some money, but everybody has some costs. They may need some rental costs, they need to buy a ticket, they may need lessons. So there's a series of questions here. All of the money raised, or rule number one, all the run, money raised must be applied to the cost of the trip. Every person has to go on the trip. First question, have they raised enough for everyone to go on the trip? If not, who should pay more and how much do they need to pay? Okay, so what you're going to do, this task exists in two places that you can access. If you want the task, you can get it off of a Google Doc or you can get it off of a spreadsheet. It's your choice, but what I want everybody to do right now is go into the chat, copy those links, because the minute I send you into groups to discuss this, you may lose the links from the chat, okay? So everybody should be able to go into the chat. You should be able to copy it. Yeah, I'm not giving you access. You have access to look at it. I'm not giving you access to uh, edit it. And now I'm gonna break you into groups and you're going to discuss how to solve this problem, all right? Now you'll notice that the problem has three blanks in it. There's three names that are missing. I want you to put your own names in there. And once you have dis figured out, once you think you have a fair way to distribute the, the money or the cost or whatever, you need to talk to the people whose names are written down in those blanks to see if they agree that it is a fair distribution of, of wealth or expense. <laughs> but I don't know, is everybody back? Yeah, I think we all got brought in. That's yeah, okay. great, I can see all 81 participants are here. Okay, well, um, does anyone wanna say anything about this task? <laughs> You're driving us crazy as people, Peter. I'm driving you crazy, Anne. That's not the first time I've driven you crazy, I believe. No, no. The first three questions were very easy to do. But the fourth question is the difficult one. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to say? We worried about the context, Peter. I mean, skiing is in these days, um, sort of the top third. And there are a whole lot of people that can't relate to it. They don't understand what a lift ticket is. They've never gone skiing. So we worry about that. And we also wondered about <laughs> if you know seven of the kids, why wouldn't you know 10 of them or seven of the people? Why were there those blanks? It's, it's like it almost was fake or made up. I mean, if you <laughs> almost. Them, you need a lift <laughs> so Steve, the <laughs> The names are blank because I want you to put your name in there. Because when you put your name in there, 
you have a lot more say in what happens in this in the solution of this task. But what I want you to do now is I want to compare these two tasks. We did two very different tasks. We did task, task one, find a number between one and two. Task two, get everyone up to the ski hill to go skiing. And you're, I'm going to throw you into your groups again only for a few minutes to talk about how the two tasks are the same or different. And I want you to, and I'm not suggesting, but there are some words here that you might want to use the vocabulary words like arithmetic or mathematics. You might want to use the word numeracy or number sense or mathematical literacy. So all of those words are fair game. But really, I'm just going to throw you out into your groups again for a few minutes to just talk about how those tasks are the same and how they're different. And I'll bring you back very quickly. So one of the things I've been working in the area of numeracy for several years. And one of the things that pops keeps popping up when I work in numeracy and numeracy is part of our curriculum here in British Columbia, Canada, is that there's a collapsing in on terminology. And, and it, as part of that collapsing in on terminology, there's a trivialization of things that are relatively complex. So can someone tell me something that came from your discussion about task one and task two? Are they actually the same category of tasks? Is there a difference? Do some of these terminologies lend themselves to one task more so than the other? Well, well we were thinking of, uh, you have to know the, the exact definition of literacy. And so I looked it up in my thing and it says the ability to read and write. Well, you know, um, that has a lot to do with um, you know, how you're going to define yourself, you know, with, you know, what, what exactly does the word literacy mean? What does exactly lit math literacy mean? And I think that, you know, higher learning, you really have to know an exact definition of a word or, you know, you've got different meanings coming into it. So that's what we discuss. What is literacy? You know, okay. math Thank literacy. <laughs> and, and to add to that, like, if we come out of this session and we've precisely define mathematics and we will be like the first people ever to do so. Um, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> finally, someone has done it, right? Like we will just, it'll be so well received. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I wanna draw your attention to is, so when I start thinking about these terms, I go to definitions. So I pull together a document that has 71 different definitions in it. Um, and I'll, this QR code will take you to that document if you want. And at the end, I'll share a link for this PowerPoint and you can pull it out of there as well. And in this, reading this document, one of the things that emerges, and this is definitions from all over the world, is that numeracy and mathematical literacy is by and large the same thing. They are geographically situated rather than conceptually situated. So for example, in Canada, numeracy is used in British Columbia, whereas every other province uses the term mathematical literacy. I believe the UK uses mathematical literacy and Australia uses numeracy. At least it was true about 10 years ago. So, so and, and, and this shifts in time and shifts in context, but by and large, numeracy and mathematical literacy are seen as the same thing. So the next question is then, what's the relationship between numeracy and mathematics? Because if they're equal, if they're the same thing, what's the point of having a term called numeracy, right? So in this regard, my favorite definition is this one by Robert Orell. Efforts to intensify attention to the traditional mathematics curriculum do not necessarily lead to increased competency with quantitative data and numbers. While perhaps surprising to many in the public, this conclusion follows from a simple recognition that in, that is unlike mathematics, numeracy does not so much lead upwards in an ascending pursuit of abstraction as it moves outwards towards an ever richer engagement with life's diverse context and situation. And this is what I tried to highlight with these two tasks. Task number one was pushing you to abstract, to get more and more abstract with your thinking mathematically. Whereas the second task does not really require high level mathematics, 
but it requires you to apply that mathematics in a really rich life context. And in this regard, I view these two definitions sort of like this pictorially. That whereas mathematics is reaching for abstraction, numeracy is reaching for context. It's trying to apply a set piece of mathematics across a richer context. And this comes from Robert's definition. And I think this is a really nice way to differentiate between numeracy and mathematics. The goals of mathematics is abstraction. The goals of numeracy is applying mathematics in rich context. And for those of you who are playing along at home, this might seem familiar to you. It seems it overlaps a lot, I believe, with uh, RME's notion of vertical and horizontal mathematization, where vertical mathematization, again, is about this abstraction uh, and generalization, whereas horizontal mathematization is applying math at a, a, across a rich contextual setting, a real setting. So this definition sort of situates a relationship between numeracy and mathematics. But what's interesting about it is that from a tool perspective, the tools we need to be numerate is less than the number of tools we need to be mathematical. So for example, I don't think any of you approach that ski task one, task number two, at all using logarithms or trigonometric relations or order differential equations, right? Like the tools that we need to become mathematical is, a, is an ever expanding toolkit. Whereas the tools to be numerate, to be able to function in life's rich context is a relatively small subset of mathematical tools they're the well-worn tools. If we picture a toolbox, you know, the toolbox that has a tray on top and then the stuff underneath, the tools that are in the tray on top, those tools that are your favorite, the ones you're familiar with, the ones that are worn and greasy and dirty, the ones that we use all the time and we know how to use, repeated addition, multiplication, whatever it is, those are the tools that we use in these ever-expanding rich contexts. That's the top tray of the toolkit. But as we're learning mathematics, we learn new tools every day. Every year we learn new tools and these tools often go into the bottom of the toolbox. And then, every, and then we take them out once in a while and polish them up. But so that from a tool perspective, numeracy is a subset of mathematics. But what's interesting is from a process perspective, and this is just my own thinking, mathematics is a subset of numeracy. The things that I need to be able to be numerate, the processes that are required me to be numerate are things like tolerance for ambiguity, sensitivity to social settings, right? Because I'm engaging in, in the real life in these rich contexts that involve humans and subjectivity, there's a difference in this. And this is certainly one of the things we're seeing here, here in British Columbia, students who have very good marks in mathematics are not necessarily better at the types of numeracy tasks that I gave you with a ski trip uh, because we have no tolerance for ambiguity. They struggle, they can do the mathematics, but they struggle with selecting the right mathematics to do in these socially rich contexts. So then the only thing I want to say in addition to this then is where do we place number sense? So number sense is in many ways, the great enemy of numeracy. Because what happens in so many rich situations that I work is that people interpret numeracy to mean number sense. And when you uh. interpret numeracy to mean number sense, it gives you permission to focus on fluency. And now we reduced a really, really rich uh, activity or a really potentially rich context to work in to something that is trivialized and is arithmetic. So number sense, and I'm just placing, and we can have this discussion, but in many ways from a tool perspective, 
Numeracy, okay, so numeracy is not mathematics. So number sense from a tool perspective, I think is a subset of numeracy, but it's a very small subset. And from a process perspective, I think it's a subset of mathematics. And again, that's just my me mm. thinking about it and, and trying to think about it. But the thing that's really, really important is numeracy is not number sense. And what I often say when I get pushed in this direction that numeracy is just number sense is I said, no, it can't be. There's no B in numeracy. Mm. And so I talk about the difference between numeracy and numeracy. So numeracy is number sense. That numeracy is not the same as numeracy. Numeracy is a different thing. And when we reduce numeracy, the richness that numeracy can offer us to the trivialities of numeracy, and not saying that it's not important, but it's, it's not sufficient, then we lose something in this. Numeracy is getting the job done with the tools you have. This is my definition of numeracy. Numeracy is stepping up and getting the job done with the tools you have. Number C is a tool. And that's the distinction that I have. So this tension between numeracy and numeracy, and I'm just, this is all just me trying to seed the soil here for some really rich conversation. Um, here are some links for what we've talked about. Oops, that middle one, you can ignore those, but the QR code will take you to this presentation and that's it, thank you. Mm. So like I said, not you're not gonna get a lecture here, but I hope we got some thinking going and I'll put that up at the end again. So I hope that's fertile ground for discussion. So, thank you, Peter. Um, mm. Yeah, we should open it up to any comments or questions. I have a comment. Um, my husband's an engineer and he's taken some pretty high up math and he said, okay, he, he's a structural engineer. And when he has to get a building done, he said, there's a certain level of mathematics that you not even touch. I mean, it's, it's like you use the lower mathematics because you've got to get that job done. And there's not for, nothing philosophical about getting a job done. So, and he's very good at numbers. So, you know, when you were talking about this, um, you know, a toolkit, um, you, you know, when I think of engineering, you think, oh, all that higher up mathematics. Well, he says you don't use a lot of higher up mathematics. He says you just got to get that, that building built. So, you know, it, you know, so different professions, you know, use mathematics in different ways. And he said, you don't use anything, you know, anything philosophical because that is not going to build the Goodyear tire plant by something philosophical. You've got to keep within a budget and you've got to use numbers and that's, that's it, you know, so that was my comment. Yeah. Uh, Peter, um, thank you very much uh, for that. <laughs> I've stimulated a lot of thoughts. Um, I, I think the, um, the difference between mathematics and numeracy is good. The, uh, the fact that you portray them in different ways in the task, was it the task perspective and the processes perspective or the tool perspective and the processes perspective uh, was very helpful. Um, I think the problem with number sense is that the, the meaning hasn't stabilized yet. Um, Case Hoagland just put up the definition yeah, from De, De Haan, yeah, um, which probably is the, the best known one, and I guess the one you're drawing on. Um, there's our colleague in Brazil um, at Recife, and it might take me a minute to remember um, her name, but she gave a talk at the last ICMI um, on, um, and uh, does anyone know um, uh, Alina, um, Alina someone, she's in the, that department that produced a lot of work on numeracy where um, Cara Hare and, uh, and uh, Schliemann and uh, uh, Nunez were in the early days. 
Um, and, and she has quite a different definition that's closer to numeracy. So I just throw that out. I think that's the, maybe the, uh, in, unless, uh, you know, one can say, well, Dehan's given the definitive word, but it is used yes. in several ways. So Jeff, I think I totally agree with you, but the problem is that we can define number sense any way we want, but I can tell you that on the ground, in the schools, at least in Canada, number sense is viewed strictly as fluency. Mm -hmm. And that, and then if number sense is then convoluted with numeracy, the numeracy collapses down to just mm -hmm. learning basic facts. Mm -hmm. And this becomes a problem. And it's, mm -hmm. and I think, I, I think that this is, this is why I, whenever someone starts talking about numeracy, I say, are you talking about numeracy or numeracy? But right? because often they, they're actually talking about numeracy. They're just reducing it down to being able to operate with numbers fluently. But um, that, that, that's strange, but that also make us uh, think about how different terms are uh, interpreted in different language in di different languages and in different countries because in Denmark we would not think number sense as something like fluency yeah. number sense uh, we, we know that it comes from two different uh, sciences one is the dehane from yeah. cognitive science but yeah. the other one is from mathematic education research Which and is the way we think about it is uh, that it is understanding, feeling, um, yeah, more, more like numeracy, actually. Mm. <laughs> but it, how, but w which other countries think like in Canada? Do you know that? I don't know that, but I think a, a huge part of this is that what we're talking about here is very situated within the English language, mm -hmm. right? Because the minute we translate into other languages and mm -hmm. then we get this lumping and the splitting that happens naturally through mm -hmm. translation where some terms collapse down into one term and others expand out into, into more rich mm -hmm. demarcations, right? So for example, in, in Canadian colloquial language, we don't really talk about didactics. Pedagogy embodies didactics. And then when you get into Europe and they split it, then you get a richer engagement with with the distinction nice anyone else oh, I, just before be before anyone leaves i um sent a feedback link in the chat if you don't mind filling that out but let's open it to some other comments yeah i i've looked into this quite a bit for some time in in uk and it's a very interesting situation in that um we had a document in that there was a big force picked on adult numeracy as it referred to here for the first part of, of, of the, this century from from about 2000 to 2010. 2011 a government document actually was published that said you should stop using numeracy and it replaced it with maths not with mathematics and I've been going through looking at definitions, particularly in ALM, for a lot of years. And then this dropped. And so its use in talking about adult numeracy um, that had been the current sort of description, of particularly of the teaching people returning to learning, technical education, all that, that had begun to be talked about as adult numeracy rather than mathematics, became talked about as maths. Um, and, it, and and in a way that still is that still is is the case. Um, and the mathematical literacy remains in in um, sort of research documents, but not in 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 the teach in the teaching. Um, so it's a very 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 strange. Thing. But but and and numeracy, as has just been referred, gets dropped down to sometimes being this very basic. Uh, a basic skills sort of use of it, um, um, which of course, as, as this lecture, is, well, thanks very much, uh, but has has um, you know said that it, it should be a much much more powerful tool, um, and the discussion of it, as I keep thinking, is is that 
defining and thinking about what we mean about it deep, deepens completely our, our sort of understanding of, of working with uh, some certain aspects of mathematics with a lot added in, particularly context and other approaches. And it's this idea of it being more than mathematics rather than a minor bit of it. Thank you, David. I agree. And I think one of the ways that we could really push forward in this conversation is to be really clear about when we're talking about tools and when we're talking about how we're using tools and when we're using tools and where we're using tools and, and, and recognizing that. Because when we stay with numeracy in the same genre as mathematics, it just becomes a poor cousin to mathematics. And when we, we talk about it in the context of rich real context, then it becomes something very different. I've heard for years, students, I'm going to kind of piggyback a little bit on, on uh, what David was saying there. Uh, I've heard for years, you know, people say, oh, I was really good at math I'm in America, so math. Um, I was really good at math until they introduced all those letters. And I mean, for me, it was, it, it's always been a distinction um, between, you know, before they introduced the letters, it's arithmetic. And after they introduced the letters, it's algebra, and which becomes the, the study, you know, as you further, further on in that process, uh, the study of mathematics. And I've always been able to make that distinction. Um, but the fine tuning that you, you did for me today, Peter, I really appreciate that. I find myself wondering how, uh, how, how it is that David Pym is not here to have to talk to us about the the, the the nuances in all the different words and the definitions and and whatnot. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Lester. So, Peter, this is Ido Girl for me. That was a wonderful. Yeah. Can I can I make a comment? Of course. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. A lovely presentation. Um, so, two points to be provocative a little bit. Uh, first. Um, this is a forum focused on adults. And so I think we need to discuss the implications of the debates regarding terminologies and definitions and, and so on for adult learners and not for regular school systems, although we are connected to them in some countries and, and, and so on. The other one, just to be really provocative, the forum is called Adults Learning Mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> Do we want to change it one day to adults learning numeracy? <laughs> or what are the implications for what we are aiming for, for processes and competencies, uh, broader issues, rather than just uh, mastery of a specific subject matter and so on. So there are many challenges ahead that we need to discuss over coffee in a face-to-face -face meeting one day. <laughs> you know what I like the best about that question is that it's clearly not for me. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's for us. <laughs> I think it's a valid, those are very valid provocative questions. I've always liked the, um, the vertical and horizontal oh. axes idea um, with, that you talked about. Um, and I've seen it before, I think with Bernstein did some work on it as well. That's um, one of the ideas where, and I love the idea, the fact that you've got context could just go on forever on the horizontal. And then the sort of the, the building of the mathematics ideas where with the core curriculum or mm. the curriculum that you, the, for the exam you're doing or the class you're doing or whatever goes in the vertical. So they, uh, but it seemed to me there's always like a graph is always there. You've always got this, the, there's always a, a spot in the middle that takes the two bits, you know, that, that you've got to have something on the X axis and the Y axis in order to make it exist. So, but I've, I've just sort of, I really like the way that def, the, that sort of, tried to simplify those ideas. Well, tried to help me think about them a bit more. And I think one of the things I didn't highlight was that that horizontal axis can actually slide up and down on that vertical axis. Mm -hmm. So that for any sort of mathematical content, there is an ability to apply it across a rich test. And I think that gets harder the more abstract the concepts get. But I don't think it's impossible. And very much like the early work on intuition where where, where the argument was that the, intu the mathematics we have at our access intuitively is, is, a, is a subset of the mathematics that we know formally. So that the more mathematics we know, the, what trails is a, a greater intuitive sense. Maybe that's true of numeracy as well. But I think that there is a real ceiling 
but there comes a point where where okay this is this is about all the math that we can use we can apply at a numerate level in rich context mm -hmm. and beyond that we're really just we're getting into modeling fundamentally mm -hmm. yeah yeah and 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 different people have different ideas about what's the most valuable axis to be moving along yeah um, i've always preferred the horizontal one but you know it's not every for everybody i suppose that's right. part of that discussion yeah but at first, we have to get people to acknowledge that there's actually two axes. <laughs> the other thing I think I would say about this is that it's helping me rethink how I, I work with adult students in that I teach at a community college in, in Washington State. And it, it's helping me rethink how I see. Um, we tend to call because we because we're trained from day one to to see students with a deficiency lens. Uh, we tend to think of holes in their knowledge and holes in their mathematics or their arithmetic, whatever. And as they come to my, say, trigonometry classroom, if they still can't add fractions, it's seen as, you know, oh, they you sort of, they missed out back then and then, you know, they need to fill that hole before they can really move forward. Um, but this is really helping me sort of reframe that here, um, looking at it from a, they're in a place in the, in the continuum, you know, do they have a high, horizontal but a low vertical or a low vertical but a high horizontal and is there is there some place in the middle where we can meet and, and and bring them to a place where they can actually still have a meaningful conversation about the con the content we're, we're asking them to learn without feeling like this has to be a like it's a deficiency model that they have to you know have the whole club before they can even participate in the conversation so it's a nice reframing and um, it's good. It feels like a foundation. Now I have a foundation here with which or from which I can move forward in dealing with students. Uh, it was amazing and I thought it was at six. I think it must have been at five. Yeah, right. Okay, I think um, that uh, kind of wraps up our conversation here. So thank you so much for participating. And um, we have a bit of a feedback link as well. I'll try and paste that into the message board again. It'll be emailed out to you as well, as well as the links from Peter's session. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. And our website has the next speakers um, coming up. So we'll also link you to that. Um, and thank you so much, Peter, for making the time um, this is your second keynote or big speech of the day. So uh, thank you for spending the time doing yeah. that. Pleasure and thanks for having me and thanks for everyone engaging so authentically in these uh, tasks and the thinking and the musing that came out of it. Yeah, it's excellent. Very provocative. Um, Beth, are you around? Did you want to say something at the end here? Uh, just to say thank you, like you've done, for Peter, it's been really good, really interesting in discussion and uh, one that keep, needs to be keeping us, reminding us about the, uh, to be thinking about those things, because I do think um, sometimes no, numeracy does get lost within the mathematics world and we are uh, sometimes a small but very beautiful group and I think it's important that we just make sure we keep, we have our voices heard. And thank everybody for attending tonight, this, uh, today, this morning. <laughs> it's been lovely to see everybody.